Hello YouTube. So this is going to be a more brief video. What I want to do here is uh, just outline Curry's paradox. This is one of the most tricky logical paradoxes. Uh, there are many varieties of Curry's paradox, but they all attempt to show from very limited assumptions that any arbitrary proposition is true. Um, it's a simple argument, uh, but it can be a little bit you know, tricky to see how it works. I'm going to try to present it in somewhat informal terms. So <clears throat> Curry's paradox begins with what is known as a Curry sentence. And as an example of a Curry sentence, we will consider the proposition A, which says, if this sentence is true, then God exists. Um, now, Curry's paradox tells us that it follows from the mere fact that there is this sentence, that the mere fact that we have this proposition, that God does indeed exist. So the mere fact that there is the proposition A entails that God exists. Similarly, um, if this sentence is true, then God does not exist. The mere fact that there is this proposition entails that God does not exist, and so on for any arbitrary claim you like. So in general, then, a Curry sentence is a sentence of the form, if this sentence is true, then P, uh, where P is any uh, arbitrary proposition. And it's going to follow from the mere existence of this proposition that, um, from the mere existence of this Curry sentence, that P is true. Um, and so we end up uh, trivialising our theory. Um, we end up being able to affirm the truth of any proposition whatsoever. Uh, so, okay, what's the uh, what's the argument for this? How does this all work? So we can begin with a Curry sentence, again, which is, a Curry sentence is just a conditional whose antecedent is itself. So if this sentence is true, then God exists. So if it's if we call it a right we'll call we call it a so if a is true then god exists so a says if a is true then god exists this is a straightforward conditional um so it's if a then b right where um where a is the conditional itself right so the the antecedent there a is if a is true then god exists and then the consequent b means god exists uh, if A is true, then God exists. The, the antecedent is an assertion of the whole conditional. Um, okay, so this is, this is the setup. Let's state the argument. All right, so first of all then, we affirm uh, if A, then A. Um, now notice that this is not presupposing that A is true. We're just saying you know, if A is true, then A is true. And that's a very straightforward assumption. This is maybe one way that you could state something like a law of identity. Um, so, you know, it's uh, it's false that mice are larger than elephants, but I'd still want to say that, well, if mice are larger than elephants, then mice are larger than elephants. Uh, if A, then A, <laughs> right? Un under the supposition that the world is some way, the world is that way. Um, so that that seems that seems reasonably simple. So okay, supposing that A is true, then A is true. Um, but now, A here is just the conditional if A then B. Remember that's that's just what that's what A is. <laughs> um, so we can substitute if A then B for either of the A's, and we're going to substitute it for the second A, giving us if A then if A, then B. Um, now, I do want to note again, you know, this is this is highly plausible, right? Like, what, what is this second premise saying? Well, um, let if, if we suppose that A is true, then it is the case that if A is true, then God exists, remember? Um, because A just is the sentence, if A is true, then God exists. A just is if A, then B. So, if A is true, then if A, then B must be true, right? So if A, then if A, then B. We're, we're making the supposition that A is true, right? What what follows from this supposition? Well, at the very least, it must follow that A is true. It must also follow that if A, then B is true, because if A, then B just is A.
Okay, so with that said then, we can now say that from this second premise, if A then, if A then B, we can infer if A then B. This is the rule of contraction and it's again very plausible. So what's going on here is, you know, we're, we're assuming A, right? So when we say if A, that's like we're assuming A. If A, so that's assuming A. Now under the assumption of A, we have derived, uh, we have derived a, right, like if you if you take this first premise, for instance, we can see, well, if A, then A. So under the assumption of A, we've got A. And then in the second, we say if A, then if A, then B. So under the assumption of A, we have if A, then B. So under the assumption of A, we have derived both A and if A, then B. And we can now apply modus ponens and infer B, right? If you, if you have A and if A, then B, then you can infer B. So under the, the supposition of A, we've derived B, which is, you know, just to say, if A, then B. So to see how this works, if this isn't clear, suppose you have it that P entails Q. And suppose you also have it that P entails that if Q, then R. Well, then under the assumption of P, you can see, okay, well, look, we've got, we've got the conditional if Q, then R, and we've got the affirmation of the antecedent of that conditional. So of course we can derive R. So we can we can say, okay, P entails Q, P entails that if Q then R, so P entails R. Um, and so we're just saying the same thing here, right? We, we're saying, well, A entails A, A entails that if A then B, so A entails B. So we have if A then B, we can affirm that. All right, if A, then B. But since A and if A, then B are equivalent, that is, you know, A is just the name of if A, then B, um, we can substitute A for if A, then B. So that gives us uh, premise four is just A. And now notice that we have a conditional plus the assertion of the antecedent of that conditional. In premise three, we have if A, then B. In premise four, we have A. So we can apply modus ponens and derive B. So here is the full argument. We begin with uh, if A, then A. Then we have if A, then if A, then B. And that's just substituting the uh, if A, then B, the, the, the conditional itself for the name in one. Um, from that, we can derive if A then B by contraction. And then we can again just substitute A for if A then B. So we get A. And then we can derive B by modus ponens. And that's it. That is that is the argument. So um, if we take the Curry sentence, if this sentence is true, then God exists, and we plug that into this argument, then we've just derived the conclusion that God exists. And of course, you can derive any arbitrary conclusion you like. Um, all right, just a quick advert. If you like my, my videos, you can, uh, you can join my Patreon. I have a bunch of bonus videos on there. So there's uh, you know, a lot of bonus content to see. Um, you can also send me a donation on PayPal. I offer private tutoring, email if you're interested, and I have a Discord link in the description. Right. Um, so... Uh, I just gave this presentation of the argument, but there are other ways to present the argument. Um, and so here is a slightly different way to do it. Uh, so in this, in this version of the argument, we begin with, um, we begin with what's sometimes known as the rule of assertion, which is basically just a statement of modus ponens. So we say, well, if you have A and if A then B, then B, right? A and if A then B, so if, if A then, sorry, if A and if A then B, then B, right? That's premise one. Um, again, just a statement of modus ponens, right? If you have A and you have if A then B, then you can infer B. Um, so uh, that's pretty simple. But remember that in this case, when we're dealing with a curry sentence, a just is if A then B. So where it says if A then B, 
I can substitute in a. Um, so that, that gives me a and a. If a and a, then b. But a and a is redundant. It's logically equivalent to a. So we can now infer just if a then b. And once we have if a then b, well, that's, again, just the same, uh, that, you know, that, that is just a, right? So in the case of a curry sentence, at least, that is just a. So we can substitute in a. And now we can have uh, the conclusion b, as before, from modus ponens. So, again, very simple, straightforward argument. Um, here's another way to do it. Um, this time we'll explicitly use the truth predicate. Uh, again, we're beginning with the curry sentence, if A is true, then God exists. Uh, now, the majority of philosophers will say that any plausible theory of truth has to entail uh, the T sentences, sentences of the form uh, P is true, if and only if P. Um, so from P is true, we may infer P, and from P, we may infer that P is true. That's a very minimal condition. I mean, so the basic idea is just like, the proposition snow is white is true, if and only if snow is white. So... From the claim that the proposition snow is white is true, we may infer that snow is white. From the claim that snow is white, we may infer that the proposition snow is white is true. That's basically what we're saying here. Um, now, okay, so this is all this this is all that's required, right, of the truth predicate. Presumably, the, the truth predicate obeys these rules, right? Like this is just this is just how we use the concept of truth. There might be more to say about it, but at the very least, we can say this. Um, Okay then, so <clears throat> again, we have the curry sentence, if A is true, then God exists. And then if we sort of plug this into our, um, you know, our, our, our uh, T schema, our, our claim about truth, then we have A is true, if and only if, if A is true, then God exists. Um, and remember, A just is the conditional, if A is true, then God exists, right? A is the name of that conditional, just as snow is white enclosed in scare quotes is the name for the proposition that snow is white. Um, so this is, again, you know, this is this is equivalent. So we have A is true, if and only if, if A is true, then God exists. And this is equivalent to two claims, right? If, if A is true, then God exists, then A is true. If A is true, then, if A is true, then God exists. All right, with that said then, here's the the argument. Uh, so, if A is true, then if A is true, then God exists. Um, again, we're not saying that A is true, but we're just saying, like, if A is true, then if A is true, then God exists. And that follows from uh, TA there. But then, if A is true then God exists. And this follows from premise one by contraction, as explained previously. But then it follows from two, that A is true. Uh, because you can go, so if, so again, you know, A is true, if and only if, if A is true, then God exists. Well, two affirms that if A is true, then God exists. So we can infer that A is true. Um, but now you have, again, conditional and the affirmation of the antecedent. If A is true, then God exists. But A is true, so God exists. Um, so that's basically how Curry's paradox works. Uh, and as you can see, you don't need that much, <laughs> right? You really, as long as you've, as long as you're able to state a Curry sentence, um, then the you know, the, the sort of logical tools that are required to get to the trivial conclusion are very minimal indeed. Um, so, you know, I mean, this type of problem, it provides additional motivation for views like Tarski's semantic theory of truth, where there is no universal truth predicate, but a hierarchy of formalized languages that would prevent the construction of the curry sentence in the first place. But if you have a curry sentence, um, if you're able to construct a curry sentence, then, you know, looks like you might be in trouble. Um, or you're going to have to, you know, deny some of these very minimal logical uh, inferences. Right, 
Well, that's all I wanted to talk about there. I just wanted to explain Curry's paradox. Um, and I will uh, see you next time. All right. Bye, everybody.